As an American-born granddaughter of Armenian genocide survivors living my entire life in the diaspora, I always wondered whether I would ever have the opportunity to journey to the land of my ancestors in Western Armenia. Like many of us, I was deeply conflicted by the thought of being a tourist in present-day Turkey, and I was entirely unsure of how I would react to the reality of our occupied homeland. When the opportunity finally presented itself in the summer of 2014, I decided to go with a group of dear friends and new acquaintances. It turned out to be a truly life-changing experience, as I was privileged to learn so much from our group's experts, Khachik Muradian, George Aljayan, Matthew Karanyan, and Baret Maronyan. And being able to share this unforgettable experience with my dear friends Becky Berberian and Nora Yakubian made it even more memorable. For those who are pondering taking the same journey, and for those who, for whatever reason, will not have the opportunity to go themselves, I did my amateur best to document our trip with hours of video footage. This short film is not only meant to show the highlights of our journey, but its goal is to show the unimaginable magnitude of our collective loss, the pride in our rich and ancient history, and to awaken in those who see it a sense of longing and belonging, identity, hope, perseverance, and ultimately an individual and collective will to triumph over adversity. We had to fly from the U.S. into Istanbul, but the purpose of our trip was to go to Western Armenia. We decided we were not going to be typical tourists, so we limited our days there to visiting only Armenian sites. To my surprise, being surrounded by Turks, eating the foods we all know, and hearing the language and music in the streets and restaurants all felt eerily familiar, as I used to hear my grandparents speak to each other in Turkish. They looked like us, and we looked like them. Walking on the streets of Istanbul, tourists from America, Europe, and Asia were easily identifiable, but the Turks we encountered spoke Turkish to us, thinking we were natives. We walked through Taksim Square, the scene of recent protests against the government, but also the location where dozens of ancient Armenian tombstones were recently uncovered. We visited the Shishli Armenian Cemetery, where the first genocide monument was built in 1919, then taken down by Ataturk a few years later. In its place, at the time, the Armenian community planted a tree almost a hundred years ago, which has now grown as an unmarked genocide monument with a white marble carved cross in front of it, but no inscription. It is a beautiful, living, growing monument to the victims of the genocide, and everyone knows why it is there. We walked over to the offices of the Agos newspaper and saw the black plaque in the sidewalk marking the exact spot where Hrant Dink was assassinated in 2007, engraved in Turkish and Armenian. As we stood in silence at the site, we recalled the chants of more than 100,000 Turks yelling, We are all Hrant Dink, we are all Armenian, and wondered why the Turkish government cannot face its own history and take responsibility for it. The plane ride to Elazik, previously known as Kharpert, was unsettling, as the flight map showed us flying over Yozgat, Malatya, Sivas, Sepastia, all familiar names. Good morning. Tell us where we're going. Well, we're leaving the hotel in Elazik, and we're heading up to Kharpert right now. We're going to see the ruins of Kharpert, and we're going to see a fortress there, and we're going to see a couple of monasteries south of Kharpert. Our first site in Kharpet was the fortress built in the 11th century BC at the very top of a mountain overlooking Kharpet. A large Turkish flag waved on top of it, denigrating its beauty. It was an emotionally difficult experience as I realized for the first time that I was breathing the same air and walking the same roads where members of my family, people that I actually knew in my lifetime, were born, grew up, and then had family members murdered as they were deported and exiled from their ancestral homes. And the sense of loss set in, knowing that the new generation and those who are still to come 
will never be able to experience that first-hand connection. We visited a museum house in Kharpert, labeled as a typical affluent Turkish household at the turn of the last century, which still had its original furniture. As we wandered through, we were shocked to discover a silver plate engraved with Armenian letters, Doktor Aleksan. The Turks were trying to erase the presence of Armenians, but there it was. As we drove through breathtaking scenery, we realized that our homeland is truly beautiful, and while our own families and ancestors lived and thrived here, building churches and roads and bridges and villages and fortresses, now there is no one left. For the most part, it is just empty land with small villages scattered around. Upon finding Khulavank in a small village outside of Kharpert, we discovered, as we were to consistently find throughout our journey, that the altar area of every church is dug up with broken stones strewn around. Apparently the Armenians had hidden gold and other riches in the floors of these churches, deceived into believing that their deportation was only temporary, and they would be back to reclaim them. Obviously they never did, and the local Turks dug them up and stole them, since there is nothing left. Even worse was the fact that the bases of the stone columns in these churches have been chipped away by Turks hoping they will collapse once their structural foundation is weakened. And yet, these ancient churches, many over a thousand years old, stubbornly stand as a testament to the resilience of our people. The highlight of Kharpert was our climb to the ruins of Palu Castle at the top of a mountain bearing a huge Turkish flag that can be seen from miles away. The castle was built in the 9th century BC by King Menwa of Urartu, but the sign gives no hint that it is Armenian. We hiked to the cliff overlooking the beautiful Palu Peninsula, on which the ruins of a lone Armenian church still stand. I was haunted by the memory of a family elder telling me years ago how his mother and her sister watched in horror as Armenians being herded into the church at Palu by Turkish soldiers were burned alive while these two little girls could hear their agonized screams and do nothing but run for their lives. So there's a, there's a lake near Kharpet. It's called Lake Gulchuk, although now they call it Lake Hazar. And um, Leslie Davis wrote about it in his book, Slaughterhouse Province. He had heard, he was the council in Kharpet, and he had heard that the men the Armenian men of Kharpert and the surrounding villages were being taken out of Kharpert and slaughtered. And he wasn't sure if it was true or not, so he wanted to see for himself. He was told that they were being brought to the area around Lake Golju. So he went out early one morning, before sunrise, on horseback. He did that so nobody would see him. He rode out to the lake, and he wrote in a classified State Department report to the U.S. State Department that he observed what he estimated to be 10,000 fresh corpses. The report that he wrote was classified by state until about 1962. It was unclassified, declassified in 1962. And so that's why we know about that report today. So we're gonna see that lake. As we stood on the banks of Hazar Lake, it was so hard to imagine that we were standing on a killing field and that this serene and beautiful place also witnessed such human suffering and death. Today, it's a picnic area. The ancient Armenian village of Chungus used to have a population of 10,000. It had a huge two-story Orthodox cathedral adjacent to the ruins of an old Armenian Catholic church. Now there was no one left. We met Asya, a tiny 95-year-old daughter of an Armenian genocide survivor who was raised by a Muslim Kurd. Her son-in-law Rejai was a Kurdish activist who was imprisoned and endured the torture of having all of his teeth forcefully pulled.
Rejai took us down to the Dudang Gorge, the most haunting and difficult part of our journey, as we learned that virtually all 10,000 Armenians who lived in Chungush in 1915 were marched down to that gorge, stripped naked, and thrown into the bowels of the earth to their deaths. It has got to be one of the worst places in the world. As we all stood in solemn silence at the edge of that gorge, we could hear the screams of people falling to their deaths as they echoed through that dark and deep hole in the earth's surface. That was definitely the toughest day of our journey, and we all had difficulty processing our emotions. Hope came alive as we drove from Kharpert into Diyarbakir, previously known as Dikranagird, now a predominantly Kurdish city controlled by the BDP, a political party whose ideology is very similar to our own and which is very supportive of the Armenian cause. Part of its party platform is to recognize the Armenian genocide, apologize for the role the Kurds played in slaughtering their Armenian neighbors, try to make restitution, and to call on the Turkish government to do the same. This is not just idle talk. The highway welcome sign leading into the city is written in Kurdish, Turkish, and Armenian. Pariyegak. The ancient cathedral of Surpkiragos the largest Armenian church in the Middle East with a capacity of 3,000 people and seven altars was built in the 14th century, burned, destroyed, and rebuilt several times until 1915 when it was destroyed by the Turks and left empty by its Armenian parishioners who were massacred during the genocide. But in 2011, after the BDP came to power and after Armenians in Istanbul and the diaspora began matching funds from the municipality for its renovation, it was reopened in all its glory and returned by the municipal government to the Armenian Patriarchate. Deeds found there prove that over half of the city belonged to the church before the genocide, but now there were seemingly no Armenians left there to stake their claims. But once the church reopened, something happened. It served as a catalyst for Islamized Armenians to declare their true identity. And now over a hundred of them come to the church, maintain it, take Armenian language classes, and even get baptized there. Having met several of them during our visit, it was clear that they crave the brotherhood and support of the Armenian diaspora, and their courage in changing their names, from Abdul Rahman to Armen and others, is truly worthy of our highest praise and encouragement. Visiting two separate bookstores in Diyarbakir, we were pleasantly surprised to find entire sections devoted to the Armenian Genocide, with books in Turkish, Kurdish, English, French, and German lining the shelves. We also found dictionaries translating Turkish and Kurdish words into Armenian for anyone wanting to learn our language. We had the privilege of meeting the oldest married Armenian couple in Diyarbakir, Digin Baidzar and Baron Sarkis, both in their 80s. In broken Armenian, Digin Baidzar told us that both she and her husband of 60 years are the children of genocide survivors. They have tried to maintain their Armenian identity. Two weeks before our visit, they were remarried at Surpgiragos in a ceremony officiated by the female Kurdish mayor of Diyarbakir. Sadly, two weeks after we returned home from our trip, we got the news that Digin Baidzar had passed away, and now Baron Sarkis is left alone as they never had children. In the center of Diyarbakir, a monument to genocide victims was recently unveiled, with an inscription in seven languages, Kurdish, Turkish, English, Armenian, Arabic, Hebrew, and Greek, which reads, We shared the pains so that they are not suffered again. And indeed, we met many Kurds who were truly apologetic and wanted to help us seek justice. After growing up hearing nothing but revisions of history and genocide denial from the Turkish government, hearing these Kurds say these words was surreal and enlightening. We drove six hours from Diyarbakir to Van, passing hundreds of miles of vacant land. I could not help but think how this land was once inhabited for centuries by its indigenous Armenian population, only to become lonely and devoid of life with the exception of an occasional shepherd with his sheep. 
Lake Van is a beautiful clear body of water referred in ancient times as a sea rather than a lake. We chartered a boat and spent the entire day exploring its cultural wealth. The most breathtaking place we visited by far was Gudutz Island, so far removed from civilization that its sole structure, an ancient Armenian monastery where Khrimian Haidik used to meditate and work, remains almost entirely intact even after the genocide. From there we sailed to our much anticipated visit to Akhtamar Island, and as we came around a bend, were shocked to see a huge Turkish flag flying in front of it. Akhtamar's church was difficult to visit. The Turkish government has restored its beauty, no doubt, but it has also converted it into a museum, allowing Armenian Mass to be conducted there only once per year on a date of its choosing. We had to pay admission to get in, and we had to try to ignore a group of Turkish men mocking the Christian symbols as we tried to absorb the wonder of the beautiful carvings. Our dilemma was whether preservation outranks exploitation. Was it better for our ancient structures to be restored by the Turkish government for its own benefit, but at least to know that they will be preserved, albeit exploited? Or was it better to let them crumble and eventually disappear? Either way, we all left Akhtamar feeling as if we had been violated in some way, and it was not a good feeling at all. On the outskirts of Van, we visited Varakavank. We walked in right here. Yeah. These three arches fell in the earthquake three years ago. This was destroyed by the Turks in 1915, the Turkish oh. army. The Turkish army destroyed this, oh. wiped it down. Now what we have is this doorway, yes. this building right here. Yes. So they wiped off everything above the candle, wow. got destroyed. That was the most offensive to them. Yeah. This they didn't destroy and it was used as a barn. Mm -hmm. From there, we went to the Surp Tovmas Monastery, built at the very peak of a small mountain over a thousand years ago. George Aljayan had found a cemetery nearby on one of his satellite image searches, and we hiked down to the edge of Lake Van to find it. There were easily more than 150 graves there, largely intact. It was obvious that this was a newer village, as many of the gravestones had dates in the 1800s carved on them. The most moving one had an inscription in Armenian, no name, no date, just the words, Hishek Eats, remember me. It sent chills down my spine as I silently whispered a prayer for that poor Armenian soul whose grave had not been visited for at least a hundred years since the genocide. We remember you. Our trip to Gars was by far the most uncomfortable of all. Gars has a 60% Azeri population, and they are very conservative Muslims, intolerant of Christians. Right outside our hotel was a huge statue of President Aliyev, flanked by the Azeri and Turkish flags. It hit home in a more contemporary way, knowing that these were the people presently killing our soldiers on the borders of Armenia and Artsakh. Every single one of us in our group felt ill at ease. We found the Church of the Apostles, which looks like an Armenian church from the outside, absent a cross. But when we went inside, we were shocked to find it had been converted into a mosque. There were already two existing mosques directly adjacent to it, which added insult to injury. Our experience at the ruins of Ani was similar to Akhtamar. Once the land of a thousand and one churches, Ani's remaining structures are being restored by the Turkish government in exchange for it being named as a UNESCO site, generating substantial income from tourism there. The most striking thing about Ani is the fact that it is right on the border with Armenia. In fact, one month before this trip, I went to the small village of Aniavan in Armenia and traveled right to the border where I could clearly see the ruins of Ani from the eastern Armenia side. I took rocks from there as souvenirs and joined them with the rocks I took from the Western Armenia side in a symbolic attempt to unite Armenia into the homeland that it is. I think it's important for us to show up to these places. You know, one, one, first because people should realize that there are 
people somewhere out in the world who feel some kind of belonging attachment to this land, for whom these churches are important, and therefore, uh, you know, th this sense of, you know, we should take care of these things because clearly it's important for some people. And they're coming all the way here to see them, right? But also, not only because of ruins, but also because of human beings, right? This is an area with a lot of people who have different conceptions about what an Armenian is, who Armenians are, what happened to the Armenians 100 years ago. So for them to see so many Armenians come, talk about their Armenian heritage, Armenian past, the fact that their grandparents are from this, these parts of the world, right? Uh, creates, you know, ripples of goodwill, ripples of positive uh, impression. And it, uh, you know, and it reinforces certain positive things. And, you know, and especially if we are not just coming here completely disconnected from the environment around us, from the people, and just going and looking at stones and rocks and taking pictures of them, right? It's very, and a lot of people do that. It's very important for us to interact with the locals because, you know, think about these churches a hundred years ago, right? The environment is what makes the church important. If you remove these re remains and take them to Yerevan and you put them somewhere, they're not going to be the same thing anymore. So, and today's environment is, are the people who are living here. They're part of this environment, they're part of this history, and it's important to preserve the church, you have to preserve the environment. You have to be in, in good, you know, communication, in, a, in, in good relations with the environment. It's a very symbolic day for all of us to be gathered here, and today was a testimony that the world is so large yet so small. We've got filmmakers, we've got historians, we have authors, people from all walks of life. And the common thread that ties us together are that we're passionate Armenians searching for answers. This was a great trip. It was, it was, a, it was a time to reflect and to reevaluate. A lot of questions were answered and a lot of new questions have risen. I had the opportunity to visit Vaughn in Gars. And one of the most powerful experiences for me was visiting Ahtamar because I felt that I was faced with a, a, a really um, almost like violent situation. It was just violence and I felt humiliated and I felt insulted and I felt offended. Um, and having come from Diyarbakir and seeing the Sukhiragos church there and the way they had restored it and the way uh, it had become for uh, the few community members, Armenians, uh, to go there and to feel comfortable there. And then seeing Ahtamar and the way it had become a museum and the way uh, it was like a, it had become a trophy. Um, and I was walking around and I saw, you know, uh, local tourists there and they were very disrespectful and I walked around the place and I went down and I was reading the signs, all, no mention of Armenians and as I was coming up I saw Gulisor Akum who's our uh, Kurdish correspondent in Diyarbakir and we just looked at each other and I felt that I had this stone stuck in my throat and it was, I couldn't swallow and I just started sobbing. <laughs> I just started sobbing seeing her and she just came over and I could tell that she understood exactly what I was feeling and she just hugged me. And as painful as that was, it also gave me hope in a way because I had made a connection with Girly Sword that was very meaningful and it was, it really meant a lot. Um, so that was the most powerful experience I had. We had a very diverse group of uh, travelers from um, artists, writers, filmmakers, activists, and we all had one um, common thread that we shared, is that we're all survivors, we're all grandchildren of survivors. Um, what was great to finally be able to do was to actually connect with Western Armenia, because I think up until now it, it's been um, just something we've heard about and talked about seeing and going to and, and getting these lands back. It was uh, obviously unexpected, you know, 
I didn't know what I was going to experience. And in fact, it's, and I, I shared this with some of my friends here, uh, the first day when we were in Istanbul, we were treated so well at the hotel, and uh, uh, I even told my friends, I said, you know, I'm surprised that these nice people did what they did to us a hundred years ago. And uh, I tried to find some sort of an explanation why it happened, why the genocide happened, knowing, you know, seeing, experiencing how nice these people were in Istanbul. You know, I think um, when you come here, you and you have the different experiences. For me, every time we go into a small village and I find a place that I've researched or I've known about, but I don't know the current state of it, and I haven't been able to talk to the people there uh, until now, that's when I get the greatest, uh, really, satisfaction from uh, hearing that. Something that you can't just get from a book. You cannot get the terrain, you cannot get the layout, you cannot hear those villagers' stories unless you come here. And, and um, from that perspective, I have to keep coming back. I also feel, you know, I keep coming back because I think uh, there's a political message there that's important to me, uh, one that conveys not for me the coming here isn't for us it is for us in the sense we get something from it but I think it's as much coming back for the people here to see us coming back to see that we have an attachment to this land that after a hundred years uh, they cannot rupture our ties to this land um, for me that is uh, critically important that that message gets conveyed because for 70 years we were absent from this land and the only message that conveys is disinterest in the land. Um, I think they are shocked and amazed at a number of things when we come here. One, that we come here at all after a hundred years. Two, that some, some of us speak the language as if we're native speakers. And three, that we know the land and the history like we were born here, even after a hundred years. So, uh... We unanimously decided that we couldn't leave Western Armenia without at least placing our feet on the base of Mount Ararat, as we could not do so from the Eastern Armenia side of the border since it is under Turkish control. So we hiked two miles from the main road to the base of the mountain, as we reaffirm to ourselves and each other that we want our mountain back. You can't replace that feeling you get when you step foot on this land. I, I mean, for me, from a kid, I couldn't be kept from this land. I couldn't be kept from this land. There's a saying, parting is such sweet sorrow, and that's, that's really how I feel right now. After taking this life-altering trip, I would strongly urge and encourage every Armenian to do so. I learned that our homeland is not some esoteric or ambiguous figment of our imagination. It is real. It is waiting for us. It is crying out for its flock. Our claim to it cannot remain theoretical. The people there, the Kurds and the Turks, need to know that we are connected. We have not given up. We will never give up until justice is restored to our people. This is our burden, our duty, and our responsibility to all the innocent souls whose blood and bones nourish the soil. It is our ongoing journey back to the homeland.